Okay, um, so welcome, welcome everybody to, to this event. Um, and we are very pleased to have this night, this event, jointly organized with ActionAid. Um, this is uh, an event which is part of a series of events that the economics department at SOAS has been organizing on many of these themes. Uh, last week we were uh, discussing issues related to Africa, and this year we are, this, this, this week we are moving uh, to Southeast Asia. Um, we are very pleased also because uh, we had some discussion around the theme of this uh, uh, presentation of uh, uh, this report and the work that ActionEd has been doing in Bangladesh over the last months. Um, and uh, I had the pleasure actually to collaborate with, uh, with Lila uh, in uh, the review of this, of this report. Uh, I was told that actually this is going to be the uh, launching event of uh, this specific report, Diversify and Conquer, or we got uh, a copy of it, I guess, from outside. Um, but we thought we want to start with this report and uh, uh, move the discussion forward, also in terms of the work that ActionAid is doing at the moment on the ground, and our speakers are going to give us an idea of that, and also involving uh, other academics very active on research related to uh, the main themes of this report, which is really focusing on industrialization, structural transformation, and the role of uh, jobs, creation of jobs, good quality jobs, and so on. And this is really, for many of you following the current development debate, is really one of the main key areas of uh, investigation. Just let me remind you that just the last human development report, 2015, published last December, was uh, around work for human development. And this was the first human development report addressing in a so explicit way the importance of uh, um, productive transformation and creation of uh, works. Um, this night we are going to have uh, a number of uh, very distinguished scholars who have been working a lot on this, on this area. Uh, I will give a brief introduction and then I will uh, pass the, uh, 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 give the floor to uh, ActionAid to start with the first introduction and then we will have a first round of reaction and then we will open the discussion. We have a small room because we wanted to have a more uh, uh, interactive type of uh, session. Uh, so the presentation from ActionAid is going to be given by uh, the co-authors of this report, uh, Dr. Lila Caballero and uh, uh, Mr. Kazi Ak, who is actually arriving at the moment, yeah. so don't worry, we're going to have both of them. Uh, Lila holds a PhD in uh, government from the London School of Economics, um, and she's a policy advisor for private sector and development finance at ActionAid uh, UK, um, and uh, work mainly focused on ways of supporting the domestic private sector in uh, developing countries, uh, and uh, she has been working directly on the ground on, on, on this specific report. So she has a very direct knowledge of what, what uh, she's going to present. Uh, uh, Mr. Hack is uh, a political economist, he's been working on urban environmental uh, change and governance, uh, policies, civil society integration, and uh, he's currently advisor uh, for uh, ActionAid uh, Bangladesh uh, on the national development uh, strategy. Uh, previously was involved and uh, worked as a senior lecturer at the Institute of uh, Governance Studies uh, at Brock University. Then we have some friends and colleagues from uh, the UK. Um, uh, I will start from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dita uh, Chopra, who is a, a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies, one of the, uh, as you know, leading centers in the UK working on development issues. And she will bring a uh, very important social protection angle into the discussion. So uh, we will start with her to comment this, this report. Um, Dita is a social policy researcher with a focus on uh, uh, rights-based policies and programming. She's been working extensively in uh, policy analysis, uh, bringing lots of political economy uh, issues into that analysis. And in particular, uh, she's been working on the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act and the food rights in, in uh, in India. Uh, then we will uh, link up this discussion uh, with uh, uh, Professor uh, Jeff Kenner from the University of Nottingham, who is actually going to bring uh, a legal perspective into this, into this discussion. Um, he's a professor and chair of European law at the University of Nottingham at the Faculty of Social Science, and his main expertise in, this is, uh, in the field of European Union uh, employment law has been involved in various uh, projects, European uh, uh, projects uh, related to uh, uh, these, these themes. And finally, uh, we have uh, the very pleased to have Professor Mushta Khan, who is Professor of Economics at SOAS, who is one of uh, the world leading institutional economists, uh, himself from, uh, from Bangladesh, working for over two decades on issues related to um, uh, 
uh, institutional change, governance, corruption, anti-corruption, industrialization, rent-seeking, and, and, and uh, you, you, you might be interested in some of his uh, more recent work, specifically on uh, Bangladesh, working also with uh, 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 Nobel Prizes like uh, Douglas North and uh, Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, is involved in the task force on uh, uh, industrial policy in uh, the Columbia University Initiative for Policy Dialogue, and has been consulting various international organizations on these themes. I will leave uh, Mushtaq to give the last uh, set of comments because I think that would open the discussion to the broader situation of Bangladesh today and uh, the political economy challenges that this uh, country is facing in relation to uh, these themes. Uh, we are going to have, as I said, around 10 minutes each, uh, and if Will I like to, to start or do you want to wait for your... It's actually okay because I start our presentation. Fantastic. So hopefully so Kazi will magically appear when it's his turn to come in. That's fantastic come in. coordination. Um, yes, we, we <laughs> planned this all along. I'm going to stand up because I realize that you will only hear my voice and not see me if I sit down. So first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, and I want to thank Antonio, Deepta, Mushtaq and Jeff for, for joining the panel. It's it's really, really great to see that there's actually interest for this work because we think it's a topic that's really important. Um, just to give you a, a background, so this publication, Diversify and Conquer, and the new one, um, What a Way to Make a Living, is part of a project that at ActionAid we have been developing since last year, um, actually 2014. I keep forgetting we're in 2016. Um, and it's a project about calling for economic transformations that create more and better jobs in developing countries. Of course, this transformation we think should be led by developing countries themselves, but necessarily there needs to be policy support from the global north, from international actors. Um, to, uh, today, as I was saying, we released What a Way to Make a Living, which reflects more broadly on the project, uh, which is a three countries pilot so far, which is Bangladesh, which is what we will be discussing today. But we have also been working with chambers of commerce and businesses in Uganda and Vietnam. So this report, uh, What a Way to Make a Living, reflects on our work in all three countries. So do have a look, keep in touch, because we will be holding a series of events this year around <coughs> What a Way to Make a Living. This is a longer piece of work that ActionAid is engaged in. But today we're here to talk about Bangladesh. Bangladesh, in its efforts to industrialize and to grow, has pushed the manufacturing industry or, or has championed as its manufacturing industry garments, ready-made garments industry. They have created, so the industry was first established in the 1950s, but it didn't take off until the 19s, sorry, in the 1970s, but it didn't really take off until the mid-1980s. So far, uh, or up until the latest uh, reliable statistics, which is 2013, 4 million jobs have been created. Garments represent 84% of the country's exports, and roughly they, ma they make up 10% of the national GDP. So they have put all their eggs in the garment ba basket when it comes to manufacturing. But we all know that garment jobs are pretty exploitative. The majority of garment workers are women, um, and they earn very little money. And the industry, as other export-led industries that have existed in the past, replicate societal discrimination against women, which holds women back from, from thriving and, and being able to access decent and dignified jobs. Now, post Rana Plaza, some improvements were made. ActionAid has been working with garment workers for a very long time. One of the ways we work with them is we set up rights cafes um, around factories or in locations where garment workers work, or, well, et cetera, where the factories are, are located. And we spoke to some of the garment workers we've been working with uh, last August when uh, I joined my colleague Kazi to do some <coughs> on-the-ground testimonial work or, or um, key informant interviews in DACA. We spoke to a few of these women and they were saying, I mean, yes, things have changed a little bit. Yes, they have built canteens. Yes, we uh, now get our salaries paid in time, but there's a long way to go. Our salaries are still not a living wage. So even though the minimum wage was raised, it's still not a living wage. Um, and the, the reality is that they have nowhere else to go. There are no other job opportunities for them, and so they're a bit stuck. And that's the case with job, crea job creation in, in general. 
in Bangladesh. There aren't really, the, there isn't really the capacity for, for the, the vast amounts of job creation that the country needs, even less for these jobs to be decent, dignified, um, and really to produce the, the income, the human capital that the country needs. So what we're suggesting, what we're recommending is that Bangladesh um, transforms its economy uh, and develops a diversified, high value added manufacturing sector. And we can get more into that in detail in the discussion if you want. Um, but what we're saying is that, first of all, it's no longer a good idea to put all the eggs in one basket because if you rely, if you're at the bottom of the global value chain and you rely on foreign dynamics, you need, to, you need to have a backup in case things really go wrong. Secondly, what we're saying is that Bangladesh needs to invest in emerging manufacturing sectors that are of higher value added. What does this mean? It means that of the total value of the finished product, a higher percentage or proportion of it should be created in country in Bangladesh rather than just assembling pieces where very, very little value is added. So therefore, if we look into higher value added, this means bigger profit or more profits for the business owners, which then allows them to pay higher wages for the work time. I'm not saying this is automatic, right? You do need to create a whole system legally, but also of monitoring on behalf of civil society, of unions, um, to make sure that workers' rights are respected, that living wages are paid, and um, so, so it requires a, you know, a, a larger effort. But um, if Bangladesh can compete on something else than cheap labor, which is what it's been competing on for the garments industry, then, then it has a, a better chance, a little bit more leeway to do this. Um, in the, um, so, so this is something similar to what Taiwan and Korea did in the 1950s to 1970s, which was create um, a long-term industrial policy to start investing in these emerging sectors. Now, it's not that easy, and I'm sure Kazi will tell you why it's not that easy, um, but we will get to that in a minute. And then um, we're saying that this is actually possible, so we don't think this is just a fairy tale or, or a wish list. There are two emerging sectors that have already been identified by, uh, by government planners, in Bangladesh, in the last five-year plan, which is a national development strategy, two, um, two sectors were identified, which is light engineering, which is light manufacturing. Um, it's normally smaller to medium, um, but growing businesses. This is a picture of, you can see that we were actually there, because you can see Kazi and myself in the pictures, <laughs> we were there. Um, these are businesses that are located both in the, in the old part of, of the city of Dhaka, but they have also larger production sites um, out, out of the city. They produce anything and everything from uh, the parts for a ceiling fan to agricultural machinery, right? They meet currently 90% of the local needs, so there is potential. There definitely is potential. Um, the second sector that has been identified is electronics. Again, we were there. These are actually pictures taken by us. Um, this, this industry at the moment is more of an assembly industry. So it's, I mean, there's a lot to, there's a lot to be done to, to improve, of course, the conditions of, of the workers. We're not championing these, these two sectors. We're just saying that there are options and Bangladesh needs to explore these options. But it's not gonna be that easy. So during this field trip, we talked to businesses in these two sectors, particularly in the light, uh, light engineering or light manufacturing, and we wanted them to tell us the opportunities and the challenges they themselves see as crucial, as key stakeholders in this transformation, and I'm hoping that Kazi can talk to you a little bit more about that. So if you'd like to come over here. Uh, sorry, I was almost uh, too early for the next workshop. <laughs> <laughs> We plan this magically. See, he's here in time. And you know, the are uh, quite uh, reputed to be late, so I thought late. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm coming outside from London, and, uh, and so far, I mean, since uh, I'm not that familiar going around London, it seems crazier than Dhaka. I mean, it looks, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's not the case. Not quite. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, uh, 
Then why are you wanting me to start from here? Yeah, so maybe if, if we can share um, with colleagues uh, yeah, sure. some of the experiences that we've heard from, yeah. from the businessmen that, that we talked about. Uh, that we talked about. I mean, uh, when it comes to, uh, I mean, say, economic policies, I mean, there are so many experts sitting here, uh, <laughs> one definitely from my country, and we'll be proud of him. Uh, so it's uh, really a bit scary to speak in front of them, but of course, I mean, they're always there uh, to correct me. Uh, what we felt uh, as part of our India's research over the last one and a half years, and of course, as part of this study, uh, there is a kind of uh, uh, sort of economic fundamentalism, so to speak, about uh, macroeconomic policies and uh, hands off I mean, government uh, with, with respect to economy in the country. And definitely, uh, there is, uh, when it comes to uh, industrial policy, there is very very uh, apparent, and you can always see that. <coughs> uh, so, uh, and it, it seems, I mean, since I mean, as part of this study and uh, of the overall study that I'm part of, <coughs> so we wanted to take more of a uh, political economy uh, uh, approach. And it seems that uh, if you see, I mean, of course, there is this huge uh, affair, a love affair with the governments nowadays, <coughs> in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, uh, Professor Khan has some interesting uh, writings about how actually uh, governments came up and was kind of taken up uh, by the political elites, whom I always call political economic elites, uh, <laughs> because I think uh, Bangladesh at current stage of its uh, capitalist development, so I mean, you cannot be just political elite and economic elite, I mean, it's so kind of mixed up. I mean, you were a big business and you were an MP and you were a minister, it's like that. <coughs> uh, so it seems that one or the other sector is picked up. So now it's governments. Uh, just say 30, 40 years back it was Jew. Uh, so it seems like just one or maybe few, but it's never more than that. It's usually one and maybe few more sectors who are actually not at equal level uh, of attention with it uh, are picked up and uh, they are to keep political economic elites satisfied. I mean, if you uh, see governments now, definitely, I mean, people who have been benefited from governments uh, were very close to power uh, of various stages, uh, uh, and that's how they became benefited uh, of this. And governments was also sort of a uh, was a kind of government project. I mean, it was never uh, the way the World Bank promotes. I mean, how they did so good in governments because it was uh, open economic policies and. Market, uh, or in, uh, market driven free market policies, uh, it's, it's never uh, that simple uh, as uh, we see in Professor Khan's uh, writing that I was referring to. Uh, so that is, that is uh, the, a big uh, drawback, we think. I mean, uh, and, and, this, uh, and when, when this thing happens, that they are giving attention to one sector, so now it's governments, it was true beforehand. Uh, that is not only just prioritizing that sector, but it is often done at the cost of other possible sectors. Uh, for example, I mean, governments, I think hardly few countries you will find that it is separately treated as a sector. Uh, I mean, common sense and also the, uh, the way sectors are kind of, of, of course there are uh, uh, different explanations, but the way they are understood in general, I mean, it is, it is supposed to be part of largely the textile sector. But in Bangladesh, governments kind of thrived at the cost of textiles. Uh, for example, I mean, we had this, uh, uh, these conditionalities that certain uh, percentages of your inputs in governments have to be domestically sourced. And there was a huge fight over the years between the government's uh, 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 industry leaders and the textile industry leaders to bring it down. I mean, the textile industry leaders, they didn't want uh, this, uh, uh, co I mean, this, uh, uh, ratio to go down, that how much you actually domestically source in, and the governments were bent on to like get away with all these kinds of requirements and let us, you know, it's hurting our business and it's hurting employment, it's hurting women's empowerment, blah, blah, blah. Of course, I mean, they wanted to get rich uh, very quickly. Uh, and uh, often, I mean, uh, we also felt that these sectors, I mean, this kind of this prioritizing just one sector uh, this is often linked to this uh, global value chain, and of course, it's always, I mean, it seems historically, it's always at the low end. I mean, now it's at the low end of the garments value chain, 
uh, maybe before it was root. I mean, I don't know that detail. So, <coughs> yeah, but at least for garments, it's more. Uh, because, I mean, despite the fact that we are uh, kind of like, I, I heard that we see in the documents, I mean, we are one of the world's largest garments producers, I think, maybe just after China. Uh, but then uh, when you saw us very low end, and we consistently have been in the low end. Now, it's not just that we are not only uh, diversifying uh, across the sectors, but even within the sector we are not diversifying. Uh, so that's a big thing. And when it comes to this, uh, again going back to these policies, uh, as, I, as I said when I started, I mean, it is so much uh, about uh, economic fundamentals and very little about what businesses actually need or demand. Uh, and, 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 and in that case, it's definitely, uh, I mean, uh, if you are a business who are outside garments, uh, and maybe few other sectors that are given attention or that we are told to give uh, policy priorities like leather and uh, seafood. Uh, so uh, if you are not part of, say, say for example, if you, are part, if you are an electronics uh, uh, sector guy, if you are an electronics businessman or a uh, the engineering businessmen definitely you are really kind of uh, at one margin of the power map if we come up with that of the different sectors and also uh, how big you are I mean even within the garments I mean if you are a really a big uh, garments business definitely you get much out of the policy and government uh, uh, support than if you are a small garments firm like subcontracting firm who are really struggling to uh, stay in the game. Uh, so uh, going back to, I mean, uh, I think uh, there has to be much more to be done by government. Uh, and in terms of, uh, I mean, that is not just in terms of policies, like macroeconomic policies. But you also have to go to different set of policies, and not just policies, like programs, services, and institutions. I mean, we think, I mean, to operationalize policies, I mean, these three things are kind of uh, necessary ingredients. I mean, uh, short of them, I mean, your policies are just policies. They are in paper, they look very good. Uh, in, you come up with them uh, in every five, 10 years uh, as, as happening with industrial policy. And uh, we could see it <laughs> from very close since we were part of it this time. And so even, even uh, there are a lot of uh, like aspirations this time that, okay, so we will do something different and we will do actually do something this time. Uh, and uh, one manifestation of that is that uh, beforehand, uh, I mean, the previous industrial policies, there uh, never used to be a uh, action plan. Uh, that's quite strange how come it happened. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, but this time, I mean, they are coming up with this action plan. <coughs> uh, but still, I mean, even, even in this process, uh, there is continuous discussion that, well, I mean, at the end of the day, actually, uh, well, nothing much will be done. I mean, it will remain as another policy, and then we get back to it like in 2020, I mean, when five years is over uh, for this policy. <coughs> and uh, uh, we, in relation to that, I mean, the experiences that the businesses have, I mean, uh, uh, and, uh, and when we are talking about the businesses here, of course, I mean, this is more in, in, in uh, terms of the electronics and the engineering sectors, because I mean, it's really difficult to actually uh, take so many sectors as cases, so we more like focused on the, these two. Uh, and also there were other reasons. I mean, we uh, wanted sectors that were like more value-adding, uh, more technologically intensive. I mean, the sectors where you, if you thrive the, uh, in them, you become more like, uh, uh, more yeah, acquire more technology uh, and more innovation capacities. And also, I mean, the sectors uh, who employ a lot, you can employ a lot more like labor intensive uh, and also uh, where there are a lot of SMEs in these two sectors. Uh, as you know, like the kind of the focus action it has. Uh, so definitely uh, uh, they were the reasons. And what happened that, uh, what, are the, what are the moments uh, or what are the areas in which they have interfaced with government, these businesses, these SMEs that some of uh, which we visited or like the, some of the leaders of which uh, we interact with quite often. Uh, so one big interface is uh, when they have to pay tax, uh, be it income tax, be it uh, business tax. Uh, so the revenue people, that's the most, I mean, the people, group of people uh, of government uh, agencies that we interact with. 
and the and and from that experience and and compared to the their interface with uh, the revenue people uh, and uh, then what they are getting from government uh, in other terms uh, in ter in terms of policy support or programs services they have a feeling that all the government machinery cares about is how much they can extract from them uh, you see not much change uh, from the colonial times I mean, although maybe it's a gross statement but I mean, back then it was like how much we can extract, still it is like how much we can extract from business. Uh, but never, at least as far as their experience goes, how much they can be given back. Uh, uh, so, th and, and <laughs> when it comes to industrial policy, I mean, uh, we have been uh, fortunate to, uh, or unfortunate to interact with a lot of businesses, uh, uh, business representatives or like chamber uh, uh, sector representatives in the committee and also outside the committee. Uh, so they said that, well, uh, we have this nice industrial policy and the other, uh, the previous ones were also good. And so you have something in the industrial policy. So, okay, so this will be given or this uh, concession will be given or whatever. Uh, and that is not necessarily translated or coordinated with, with, your, with your tax policy or revenue policy. And so when the tax people comes and says, okay, so no, I mean, you have to give this, this you didn't give, and they say, well, according to industrial policy, and they says, okay, then go and pay your tax to the industrial uh, ministry people. And to us, I mean, what, what all we care about is the these circulars and this tax policy documents. So, uh, I mean, uh, so uh, it, it was also a discussion there, and we also felt, and as part of our research, because we are uh, again going to uh, work, uh, actually going on another uh, paper, kind of uh, extension of this, and. Um, that would be more like uh, recommendation oriented. <coughs> that is, you don't have this uh, uh, integration and uh, coordination and combination between the policies. I mean, you have these separate policies who are going like on their own. Uh, and because, because, I mean, when it comes to industrial policy in particular, and of course economic policy in general, I mean, you have to have this coordination. But when you don't have the coordination, you don't have integration, far from that, you often have the what should I say? Like sometimes, I mean, many of these policies are actually undercutting each other. I mean, you have something in industrial policy that is undercut by tax policy, and you have something in the tax policy, uh, in the environmental policy, and that is undercut by the uh, industrial policy, for example. Uh, <clears throat> so that, that's, a, uh, that's a big problem when it comes to like this <coughs> uh, policy attention even. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, going back to my discussion about that one or the other uh, sector uh, is picked up. Uh, just stop me when I'm like run out. Uh, You're uh, running running out. So I stop. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Begul is they talk too much. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I just wrap up say in five yeah. minutes or like less than that. So uh, okay, couple. Uh, yeah, couple minutes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I mean, when you have this, I mean, one uh, one sector disproportionately. Uh, even priority or like prefer. So you have a huge uh, uh, powerful beneficiaries uh, group coming up, definitely. Huh. Uh, and, and they try to kind of uh, hang on to that sector. Uh, for example, now, I mean, uh, it's the sort of a heresy if you even raise any question about governments. I mean, there are many viable questions, not only the ones that we are raising, but there are also many other questions. You can raise, but you can't raise it. I mean, it's a heresy. I mean, if you do it, that these people are against the development of the country and conspiracy, and nowadays everything goes back to the anti liberation conspiracy. So, I mean, everything is like. Uh, uh, so that that that's a that's a big problem uh, 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 at the point at this point of time. Uh, and we felt, uh, and we continue to feel, feel, and particularly the kind of mandate we have in Action Aid. Uh, that you also need an extensive uh, uh, socio-economic infrastructure uh, for any kind of industrial development. Uh, because, I mean, uh, it's not just, okay, so you uh, take policies, programs, uh, services, and institutions uh, for the businesses, but also the people who work in the businesses, the labor, uh, their families, uh, youth. Uh, I, I mean, I think, I think uh, Lila already uh, told about this uh, uh, FGD that we had with the government workers. Uh, so some of the concerns, I mean, of course, wage, depressed wage is a great concern. But then 
some other concerns like education of their children. I mean, they often can't actually educate them. I mean, they can't send them to good schools because it costs a lot. And then the schools they can afford actually are not good. And many of these government or local government schools. Uh, healthcare, I mean, they already, they really survive uh, on the wage. It's really strange how they survive. Um, that can be another episode or huge program of survival, I think, this, this reality show. I mean, it would, this would be much uh, uh, more interesting how they survive on that wage. Kasi, I, we're going yeah. to a different round, so I think if you can wrap up on the main points... Then uh, can... Yeah, uh, so, yeah, that's another thing. I mean, this uh, you have to have uh, these program services and institutions for uh, socio-economic infrastructure in addition to the uh, industrial policy. And uh, there is a huge, uh, I mean, uh, the way uh, neoliberalism, so to speak, neoliberal perspective is mainstreamed in the uh, government system. Uh, so any discussion about government involvement or government investment or facilitation of businesses, even from within the government, it says, no, 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 that will destroy the business, that will destroy the economy, that will bring that government intervention. Uh, so I think that is another important point, I mean, <clears throat> to kind of uh, see government role in new light that you're already doing in, Europe or uh, US even. So I think I stopped here okay. for now. And thanks a lot. Thanks, <coughs> thanks for this uh, initial you know, presentation, which uh, both gave lots of uh, food for thought in terms of uh, number of challenges and you know complex issues and yeah. how they are interdependent and difficult to disentangle. So our three uh, uh, distinguished speakers are going to try to help us in disentangling them and put them in a in a in a, in, a, in, a, in order in a sense according to their different perspectives. So I invite uh, Rita to start uh, from a social protection, a social rights angle. I think uh, Kazi has been mentioning these issues and already we will be discussing about the specific work condition and living standard. Uh, Rita would like to, she would like to actually show a video to start uh, and then she will give uh, yeah. some remarks around it. Can I just um, introduce the video? Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, first of all, thank you very much um, for inviting me to this. Um, just a bit, little background on, on this video, and I thought of this video only because um, the, uh, one of the main themes in this report really is, 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 is that, of, that of unpaid care work and, and, and women's, women's uh, double discrimination in terms of both the discrimination in the labour market but then also in terms of the, the entry into the labour market. And um, just to say that um, we at IDS produced this video, but this was in partnership actually with ActionAid. Um, we've been working very closely with ActionAid on their women's rights program. And this, is, this was one of the, the, the outcomes that we, um, that we did. And so if you look at this video and then I'll come back to my talk, that'd be great. It's only four minutes. I'm just hoping that it actually...
Um, so, um, coming back to um, the report, Diversify and Conquer, one of the, uh, as I said, one of the main themes um, that comes out again and again, got good news uh, um, yeah. again and again in, in, in the report is, is, is that of, uh, of, of, of gender uh, dynamics that are going on within the garment sector. Um, I mean, uh, garments uh, are, are talked about as an industry that creates jobs for women. Uh, but it recognize and recognizes that there are positive effects. There are some positive effects that are mentioned in the report uh, through interviews, things like greater freedom and autonomy, ability to, to send remittances home. Uh, women uh, are able to exercise choice in, in, in when they get married, perhaps get married a bit later. Those kinds of positive effects. Uh, but the, 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 the negative effects are, are quite, quite large as well. Uh, the report mentions Firstly, a huge amount of discrimination in the labour market. Um, women are paid less than uh, less than men. Uh, something that we call the gender wage gap. Uh, they're dismissed when they when they are about to start a family. Uh, and most of these jobs are, are as um, Ila already said, uh, that the wages that they get is not even not definitely not a living wage, and sometimes not even minimum wage. Um, and uh, I think worse still, it, it is uh, the lack of organisation uh, and the lack of unionisation in, in, the, in, the, in the sector. Um, and, and then there's these undercurrents of, uh, you know, w which in, in the report that one has to tease out a little bit more, and I'd like to reflect uh, a little bit on those. For example, um, you know, uh, the report talks at one point about, about garments being uh, seen as women's work, as it, it's come naturally. And we need to explore the, the fact that this is, this is, um, this is quite uh, discriminatory because it, it, one of the reasons perhaps of why um, uh, women are, or rather these, these jobs attract such low wages is not just because it is the garment sector, not just because prices are being uh, competitively um, reduced sure. by, by other, other, other sectors, but because it's seen as women's work and therefore it's seen as undervalued and underpaid. Um, so there is a um, there is a direct connection in in that sense, um, and the other thing that I found um, really um, really alarming was 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 this whole idea of the fact that the uh, you know the industrial sector or the the garment sector is now adapting what we call a life cycle approach to social protection to actually suit their benefits. So younger women are preferred, um, you know. Um, because they're, 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 they're preferred over, like, because they have fewer care responsibilities. And, and the report talks about the garment sector providing maximum of 10 to 15 years of employment for, for, for women. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, like, this is, this is an approach that um, at least, you know, um, we, in, in, in the, in, you know, people who work in the social protection industry 
uh, or in the social factory sector have kind of been arguing that governments should take a life cycle approach to <coughs> understanding that women face certain disadvantages. And then to, to, it was quite alarming for me to see that the industrial sector actually takes that and, and, and inverts it and says, well, we can use this life cycle disadvantage to our advantage. <laughs> um, and that, that, was, that, was, that was really, um, really concerning. Um, the report also talks about this interconnectedness between the nature of the labor force participation and the unequal burden of care work. And that's what I'd really like to focus on the, the last um, few minutes of my talk. Um, we talk about industrial transformation. We talk about economic transformation, creating better jobs, creating decent and dignified jobs. Uh, but we also talk about economic empowerment of women. Um, what is economic empowerment of women? Is it just labor force participation? Is it just making sure that women increase their labor force participation in large numbers? Um, I don't think so. I think it's probably a, a lot more than that. And we need to be cognizant of the fact that when we talk about economic transformation or economic empowerment, we are also talking about not only the, 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 the increase in the, in, the, in the opportunities that say new sectors like uh, the engineering sector um, uh, can, can or, the, uh, or the electronic sector can, can, can provide to women, but also uh, the choices. What are the choices that they have in the type of sector that women want to work in, in the kinds of locations that they want to work in? Perhaps they want to work in home-based work, um, or perhaps they want flexible jobs. And I think this is also not just about women working. I think that unless and until we change um, the working culture where, where, it's, where it's considered that, you know, that, that people can put in long working hours, um, you know, ultimately we're not going to be able to change the, the, the distribution of, of care work within the household. Because if the man is expected to work for long hours because he's outside, etc., and is not allowed the flexible working conditions that, that say women are, then how are they going to take on some of that, that, care, that care work? Um, um, so I would, I would like to um, end with um, two key terms that I would like to introduce to this, to this discussion. One is the idea of a double boon. How about creating paid work that not only empowers women and empowers in the true sense of empowerment and not just creating uh, you know, opportunities with, uh, with all these discriminations at various levels and, you know, et cetera, but also actually creates, um, uh, you know, so, so paid work that empowers women, but at the same time provides support for their unpaid care work opportunities. And, and I think that, um, sorry, responsibilities. Um, I think that, uh, you know, when, when this report talks about uh, promotion of small and medium term enterprises, my concern is that uh, we, 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 we not forget the role that the, the public sector has to play in, in ensuring essential public services. Small and, medi small and medium enterprises um, at, you know, cannot pay those level, of, those level of taxes, cannot take on those risks that we want them to take on. And if SMEs have to be at the forefront of um, this economic transformation, then they definitely need the government to support them in terms of taking on the responsibility of provision of essential public services of small infrastructure of childcare facilities. Um, you know, uh, so I think that, that the idea of double boon is really important in, in terms of like understanding the economic transformation. And the, the other word that I'd like to um, leave you with is, is, is optimizing. Uh, we, uh, in economics, we, we talk about econ you know, optimizing participation, optimizing economic participation in the labor market or, or whatever. And I think optimization needs to be really um, a bit, again, more than that. And it, the idea is that we need to optimize economic participation without deepening the time poverty of women, but also without, um, without increasing their worry about both the quantity and also the quality of care that their families are receiving. I mean, women no, don't want to you know, necessarily subject you know, and leave their families. They're driven to, to, to kind of work in in sectors which are low paid and exploitative and i think we need to uh, we need to allow them to choose better power, better paid and more empowering types of work and that can only come about when we when we talk about the role of of uh, of, of women as as an integral um, part of these these new and emerging sectors um, and and not as an afterthought great thanks thanks Peter.
that's the, the floor now for, for Jeff. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio and colleagues. Um, I was very interested listening to um, Lila and Kaz uh, a few minutes ago. And, and you know, I know you've come from, from Dakar. I've come from Nottingham, which I suppose is the second furthest away here. But I was just thinking that <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, it's strange to think that, that during the first globalization, what, 150, 200 years ago, Nottingham was the, the garment sector of the Midlands. Um, you know, just look at the street names, particularly lace market and the, the, fact the whole lace industry, um, you know, the engine of the empire at the, at the time. And, 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 and then, of course, going beyond garments. And so what, one needs to look at the, maybe the, the approach of the European Union, World Trade Organization, governments and so on, must be to think beyond where we are now. It just, 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 just occurred to me, really. But... If I could just um, say where I'm coming from, the, the Human Rights Law Centre at the University of Nottingham were one of 19 um, partner institutions. Would you mind putting up this? Yeah, 19 partner institutions worldwide, which is conducting research for the European Commission on the uh, scope and effectiveness of the EU's human rights policies. It's known as FRAME. That's the acronym, anyway. Uh, our main research in Nottingham uh, focuses on the effectiveness of the EU's engagement with human rights actors institutions, the UN, the ILO, the WTO, and states, as well as non-state actors, social partners, civil society, uh, and groups representing indigenous peoples, uh, women, human rights defenders. Um, our outputs are available, ah, yes, our outputs are available through the website, www.fp7-frame.eu, and you can see behind you uh, some of the various activities that, that are coming up, and more importantly, that all of the reports, including the one I'm talking about, will be available uh, to download and already, you know, are, are on the website. And I'm currently co-authoring co a frame report on the nexus, as we might call it, between the European Union's policies on trade, development and human rights. Uh, and part of that report is a case study to be published later this year on the EU's policies towards Bangladesh. Uh, post, in particular, post Rana Plaza. Uh, and the way in which the EU's uh, general system of trade preferences, the GSP, uh, as a trade policy towards Bangladesh, um, and alongside other initiatives, notably the EU's very active involvement in the Bangladesh Sustainability Compact, is having an influence, an influence which is very much focused on garments. Yeah. Um, as it says, to promote continuous improvement in labour rights and factory safety in the garment and knitwear sectors in Bangladesh. And my interest as a lawyer is in looking at this sustainability compact and wondering what exactly it is. Uh, it, it's what we would call soft law, or perhaps reflexive law, an instrument uh, or a process which might at some stage, uh, through a kind of constant monitoring approach and surveillance, uh, lead towards hard labour laws and social rights of the kind that uh, Deepak was talking about. Um, but there's no guarantee that it will lead to that, and it is focused on garments. And therefore, our study is looking primarily at the garment sector and uh, I found it very enlightening to, to read both of the Action Aid <coughs> reports stressing the need for diversification beyond garments as the means to transform Bangladesh, uh, to move away from this dependence that we've been hearing about, particularly bearing in mind, and this interests me again as a, as a labour lawyer, um, in the way in which in the export processing zones, the EPZs, which are special zones where wages are low, where labour law doesn't touch or not touch in the same way uh, and provide rights to people, um, where um, it, it, those seeking to organise labour are, as the report highlights, often subjected to human rights abuses. Um, and I found it as a staggering statistic to read in the report, the one you cited earlier, that 84% of exports uh, come from garments, making Bangladesh the second largest exporter of garments after China. And global trade policy, particularly as 
pursued enthusiastically uh, by the EU in a very uh, ahead, if you like, of human rights. Human rights follows in the slipstream, but trade policy has played a large part in contributing towards this dependency on garments. Um, the EU grants Bangladesh the most favourable trade preferences. That sounds good. Uh, it means that under the what is called the, the GSP Everything But Arms arrangements, the EBA, there is duty-free, duty quota-free access uh, to the, in, the EU's internal market for these garments. It, 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 and that applies in respect of all goods except arms. That's why it's called everything but arms. Now, Bangladesh only qualifies for this most favourable status because it is uh, an LDC, uh, qualifying as uh, one of the least developed countries under the UN measurements. Uh, its relative poverty uh, uh, effectively accentuates, under the way trade policy works, this emphasis because of the, the benefits that come with this uh, free trade environment. Uh, and this uh, acts as a vector for the uh, global value chains, the brands and retailers in the garment sector to exploit the so-called comparative advantage that comes with low wages and minimal regulation of factory standards. Uh, yes, um, the everything but arms arrangement does require ratification of ILO, ILO labour conventions, but it is passive. It is unilateral from the EU. Uh, it's not a partnership. And this is these con the requirement to comply with labour standards is part of a conditionality um, without engagement with government or civil society. Now that was very much the situation before the, the Sustainability Compact came in. And certainly prior to Ryan Plaza, um, monitoring was under-resourced. Uh, the prospects of the GSP being withdrawn by the EU because of labour rights on, on, violations on the ground uh, was minuscule. Now, post Rana Plaza, the EU had a choice. Keep the GSP and start to engage with the Bangladesh government and civil society and, and trade unions and other social partners, or withdraw the GSP until such time as the ILO and other actors, uh, including NGOs, were satisfied that Bangladesh was complying with its international obligations. The EU chose the former. Interestingly, the US chose the latter. I'm happy to sort of develop the reasons why. This is a highly politicised issue in the US. Um, but the EU took the very unusual step of suspending its system of preferences uh, for to Bangladesh for breaching labour conditionality provisions. Um, and it's kept this policy under review, but I think I'm correct to saying, in saying that three years on, the US GSP remains suspended. So it's a form of trade sanction. Uh, of course, the downside of that is that many people are, could lose their jobs, uh, and mainly women. Um, and this is why even some of the EU's main critics, uh, such as the International Trade Union Confederation, the ITUC, have not supported withdrawal of the EU's GSP, although I note that in the latest report there is some mention that this should be considered uh, by ActionAid, that this should be considered as an option. Um, now, one of the questions that we're looking at in our report is, is engagement through the sustainability compact alongside maintaining the GSP a better approach to addressing these issues of labour and social rights? and promoting what the EU calls responsible business conduct. Now, in our case study, we evaluate this compact as a novel model of deep ongoing, ongoing engagement with stakeholders that can lead, as I said, to a process towards uh, stricter laws that are more effective. Um, now, there are three pillars to the compact. One, respect for labour rights. Two, uh, structural integrity of buildings and occupational safety and health. And three, this idea of responsible business conduct fitting in with the global idea of corporate social responsibility and so forth. 
Now, the partners were originally the EU, the ILO, and the Bangladesh government, but later on, the US joined, and now Canada is also uh, in the compact, alongside local social partners, uh, the ITUC, um, and NGOs including Human Rights Watch. I don't think ActionAid is formally part of it as such. Um, it was initially, uh, so, so that, that's just how it's organised, but you can see straight away that it is an idea based on uh, a broader approach than the conventional kind of top-down uh, idea. Uh, the basic idea, as expressed by the Director General of the ILO, Guy Ryder, is to have a single coherent endeavour in order to avoid a fragmentation of efforts through multiple initiatives which contradict each other uh, and so on. Now there are, in fact, despite that statement, many other initiatives, um, but I'll confine my comments to the BSC and I'll, I'll try and be brief because I've probably used up all my, all my time <coughs> already. Now it seems to me that this idea in many ways has a potential to be transformative if it is implemented in good faith uh, because of this emphasis on deep engagement and wide participation. It is an externalisation of the EU's new governance concept that has been experimented on uh, internally um, in areas like employment policy and social, policy, social rights. Um, this idea of experimentalist government is one that involves strict target setting, uh, which is the case under these, each of these three pillars that I mentioned, uh, ongoing surveillance uh, with the partners, culminating in an annual technical status report, most recently in January of this year, and identifying continuous improvements through mutual learning well, of best practices, uh, so-called benchmarking. And in this way, it is hoped, concerted pressure is placed on national and local authorities to improve standards and on the global brands to act responsibly. Uh, and confidence, it is hoped, is given to local actors, women's rights groups, trade unions and others who feel that they are protected and have a voice uh, under this system. Now, the results have, in fact, been rather mixed, but um, implementing rules of the amended Labour Act uh, approved by the ILO have eventually been adopted, but this has taken three years. And an implementing act isn't actually implementation. It is just an act. Um, now, this act does include freedom of association, collective bargaining and workplace safety, but there has to be this real implementation. Over 300 new garment industry trade unions have been registered. Um, this number has doubled, but the latest report highlights uh, a slow registration process and a concern, uh, particularly highlighted by the ITUC, that there is a tendency towards government-approved or somewhat neutered unions. Um, there have been safety audits of hundreds of factories under many hundreds of new inspectors, but this is very much behind the schedule that was set in the previous uh, report. Many brands and retailers have signed up to a uniform code of conduct for factory audits, but it is only a code of conduct, you know, and one has to qu question again the enforcement and the obligations that go with it. There's been a damning report, however, published by the ITUC, emphasising the EU is sort of happy to sort of publicise these headline figures, but if you just highlight three particular problems, one, trade unions remain banned in export processing zones. Two, there remains a climate of impunity for anti-trade union violence. And three, the labour inspection regime is inadequate. The 2016 report does then set clear targets to address each of these uh, problems, including uh, a commitment by the government to upgrade labour rights in EPZs so as to be consistent <coughs> with national law and ILO standards. But we have to think that will have to be watched very closely. It also recognises the, the need to complete recruitment of inspectors and to ensure effective inspection of all export-oriented garment factories, including subcontracting factories, to provide a safe working environment. So I think there is some evidence that this process of ongoing engagement 
does force through change. But it, it's, it's slow and it's based upon the idea that there will be this continuing dependence on the garment sector. It will improve, think, uh, develop, improve the garment sector one more. But it's interesting listening particularly to what uh, Deepak has said and others. What is missing from this list? There is no mention of equal pay for women and equal access to job opportunities. Um, there is no mention to a living wage. Yes, the minimum wage, as you said. And there is very little mention of secure contracts. So the issue of dismissal of young women after 10, 15 years is not addressed. And there is no mention of including parental and sick leave and unemployment benefits in a really meaningful way. So it, it's addressing the kind of technical issues which are important, of course, and life-saving of factory inspection and basic labour rights, you know, the tick box of the ILO core labour standards, but it doesn't go deeper than that. And I think this is a, a really important concern. So this is, um, I think, just highlighting uh, what we are looking at here. Uh, and just in conclusion, I would say that uh, this report has really, I think, from my, from my point of view, in the research that we're doing, really opened my eyes to how much more we need to look beyond garments, as you say, um, and to um, say that all these... Act this is important. We've really got to improve conditions in the garment sector. And the fact that the EU has rather belatedly now seeking to address this is important. But at the same time, there's this inherent tension with the trade policy and with the demands of the European consumer within the EU's internal market to have this free flow of garments at the lowest possible price. And this is still the driving motivation. Okay. Thanks, Alfred. So, this is another very interesting set of remarks, and I think the two presentations really match uh, very well in terms of understanding you know, the complexities at the national level, the industry level, the firm level, but also this international perspective and all the efforts and limitation of the efforts that even ILO has been having over the last year, even conceptualizing the idea of decent work, good quality, yeah. and yeah. so on. And this is being reflected in the current discussion with the SDG, how we measure these things, so many of these things, I think, resonate with mm. many of the current issues. I think now we have opportunity to go deeper into understanding a number of political economy issues that actually make the situation even more complex <laughs> uh, <laughs> than what we have done so far. So please, please Mushak, please. Thanks, Antonio. Um, before I get to the political economy, I'll talk a little bit about economics um, and then maybe come to the political economy. I really liked the, the two documents that ActionAid produced. I think it's very important that we start talking about creating jobs and diversification and diversified economies because this is really what's been missing, um, in, certainly in the development discourse although not in the academic discourse, but in the actual practice of development. It's important also to then locate all the good things we are talking about in terms of empowerment and um, wages and conditions and so on in the reality of a world which is incredibly competitive, mm -hmm. where you have retail giants and buying houses pushing down prices to... Um, the absolute bare minimum plus one cent, right? They know exactly the cost of production in different countries. It says somewhere in one of the reports that Bangladesh is the lowest wage country. It's not, right? So Ethiopia is trying to break into the garments industry. It has even lower wages than... Um, SOAS is actually advising the Ethiopian government on industrial policy and garments. So we visit Ethiopia. I visited garments factories in Ethiopia. Um, this is an intensely competitive world. Right. The buyers know exactly what the cost of production is because they go and visit and they know the wages and they push the prices down to the bare bones. I think in understanding why Bangladesh is successful, it's not just that it's got low wages, it's not just that it has a, a, a competitive liberal economy with uh, limited trade union rights and all the rest of it, you have to look at the history, and I think Kazi was you know, referring to this, how the garments industry was constructed, because low wages aren't helping the electronics industry, aren't helping the engineering industries, aren't helping a million other things which could happen. 
In other words, words, low wages are not enough. So why did the garments industry succeed? It succeeded because it actually was extremely lucky in learning how to build the organizational structures and the global chains of suppliers and, and, and buyers and learning how to do the inventories and the quality control and the um, work management systems. And there's a very interesting history of how they did that, which I've written about and some of you have read it, which is really about transferring that organizational knowledge from the South Koreans to Bangladesh at a critical moment when the incentives were aligned and the MFA gave the resources to pay for that to happen, and that's how it happened. Now, I don't have time to go into it, but it's a very interesting story. If you want to raise competitiveness and productivity and conditions and so on and so on in the garments industry, you have to ask yourself, how do you, raise, how do you construct new organizations which can produce, which can be more competitive and have higher productivity, right? which means investing in completely new organizational structures. It's not, the problem is not about buying the machines. The problem is not about do you have workers with the appropriate levels of skills? So we always think of it as a skills problem or as a financing problem, right? Bangladesh does not have a financing problem. There are people with enough money to invest in lots of new industries, and there are lots of people with enough skills, and they're leaving the country, right? So that's not the, the issue, is how do you put that, all this together in an organization which is competitive, right? And competitive means you have to raise your productivity at least to Chinese levels. Right? And that means a lot of learning about organizational building has to be done. So this is the basic point. If you can't do that, then all the stuff about putting pressure from the EU and so on and so on is just going to knock people out. It's not yeah. actually going to raise wages. It's not actually going to raise diversification or new industries or anything. And this is the trap that you, know, you said about joined up thinking. We need to also join up the thinking with how to raise productivity and diversification I think this is a first step, but I think a lot more needs to be done. So let me add some other thoughts which I have on exactly on the electronics and, and, and uh, engineering sectors because I've done some work over the last 20 years also on Thailand and <coughs> Vietnam. And Vietnam and Thailand are respectively, I would say, 20 years and 50 years ahead of Bangladesh mm -hmm. in precisely those sectors. So they're a very good model of where Bang a country like Bangladesh needs to go. Okay. Now, if you look at the electronics sector in Vietnam, it's a sector which has to add or machine tools. In the 1990s, Vietnam had a lot of investment in these small engineering type, electronics type um, producers making components and making little bits of plastic and making wires and making da da da. Okay. Then what happened? What happened is that when they opened up to global competition, all of this collapsed. The same thing happened in Thailand. Thailand had very good components industries and electronics industries in the 1980s. By 2000, it had all gone. What replaced it were global multinationals. So Samsung has come in in a big way into Vietnam. And, and Samsung says, we would love to buy components from Vietnam, but the stuff you're producing is just not good enough. We are not going to put that into a Samsung phone, right? And there's no way your components producers are going to reach the Samsung phone components level anytime soon. So actually, we're going to import 95% of our components from Taiwan and Korea and so on and so on, assemble this in Vietnam. So what's happening in Vietnam? Vietnam's electronics exports are shooting up. It's their biggest export earner now, but it's basically assembly, right? And they've missed the boat. Thailand missed the boat. If you look at the history of how countries actually successfully built components industries that survived and became component suppliers to OEMs, which came and then, there are very few examples. Now, China is full of these examples because China has massive clustering but China is not an interesting country to look at in political economy terms because what they can do, no one else can, right? <laughs> so it's not a very good example. 
And by the way, not South Korea and Taiwan, which I referred to, in your, are also not good examples, right? Because of political economy reasons. So what do we, we have to look at how did successful components industries develop in countries where the state has very limited capacity to enforce anything, mm. where you have large scale political corruption, where you have powerful elites which capture resources and they can't take them away <laughs> from them. And so there are very few examples, and, but there are, right? So the Indian automo automobile sector and the components industries that developed there, very good example, right? They survived. They built up the capacity to produce globally competitive components, which then the OEMs used and Indian OEMs are also using. So if you want to really engage in, in the electronics industry in Bangladesh and have a sustainable strategy, which is not just a flash in the pan for two or three years, you have to, you have to start thinking, okay, how do we build an electronics, how you take the Dhulai Khal and Jinjira people who are doing the engineering, they are not producing anything which can fit into an OEM type activity, right? So you have to say, which of these companies can we build up as a components producer okay, of widgets, whichever, whatever the widget is, and then say, how do we take that to a globally competitive level? What do we need to do? That's a very different question from saying, let's just support all kinds of people who want to do, you know, I want to build some spare parts for a phone, or I want to um, do some refrigerator repairs. I mean, this is a different problem, right? If you want to have a sustainable industry which becomes like the garments industry in Bangladesh, you have to ask yourself, how do I construct a globally competitive components industry? And that means, I, I can, you know, I mean, that means you have to say, I want to study the global supply chain, mm -hmm. and I want to identify which bit of it in Bangladesh is likely to be globally competitive. Then you have to find another country which is moving out of that, which is probably a country like China. And then you have to go to China and say, we want to shift this entire sector to Bangladesh, and we just don't want to buy your machines. We are, going to, we are going to give you incentives to come and set up that entire organization in Bangladesh with your supply chain and your markets. And then, if you succeed, we'll give you a hefty price. And the price has to come at the end, not before. right? And that's how the garments industry succeeded. That's how the automobile industry in India succeeded. We need to replicate this. We need to understand how these things work. I think that would be my ideal, you know, where do you go from here kind of story. Those kinds of industries won't be your corner shop, little mom and pop, you know, jinjira types, but, but it might be some of the bigger ones there, might be some bigger supply chains. You are really talking of companies which employ 300, 200 people at least, which have a capitalization of several million dollars at least, even as a starting. So you're not talking of microcredit type stuff, mm -hmm. right? And then you need to find links with the Chinese and others who are moving out of those things and move them lock, stock, and barrel over. That can be done, but I don't think this government's industrial policy plans have anything to do with Far that. <coughs> and and, and th this is where I think outside influence and pressure and mobilization mm -hmm. can help. That's the only way to raise wages and conditions. It's actually creating jobs which are not only higher wage, but also competitive at that higher wage, right? You have to be able to sell against the Chinese and the Vietnamese and whoever else is in the market. And perhaps then Bangladesh can empty some space for the Ethiopians to come in and, and do the garments. But, but unless we have that continuous upward movement, it's not going to happen. Let me just end, because I, I think uh, in a couple of minutes, the political economy that um, Antonio talked about is the critical part of industrial policy. How do you actually provide resources to your emerging um, electronics or um, engineering firms in a way that won't be captured, won't be captured by powerful um, <coughs> um, elites, this so-called political economy elite that you referred to, um, which is patently there, which is extremely well organized, which um, ca captures resources all the time, and not just in Bangladesh, but all developing countries, or most of them. If you look at the South Korean Taiwanese strategy, which you really um, promote in this What a Way to Make a Living um, booklet, their strategy was to give lots of subsidies to companies as investment funds to build capabilities, to build new organizations. Then they monitored what they were doing with it, 
And then when they didn't perform, they took it back. And not only they took it back, they punished those people by restructuring those companies and changing managements and so on. This is not remotely a possibility. In, <laughs> in any Asian African country, apart from the Northeast Asian ones, which had a very peculiar history of Japanese colonialism, which created a very specific kind of society and a power structure, this can't happen in Bangladesh, right? So those examples are not even starting points. I think we need to find out ways of financing capability development in ways that can't be captured. And, and what I do in my own work is to make a distinction between ex-ante and ex-post prizes, right? You can give the money ex-ante, and then you need a very strong state which has the capacity to... This won't work, right? It's not, not in Bangladesh. So you have to think of ex-post ways of financing it. That is, you find a way of rewarding success after it is successful and make that very credible. And that encourages the private sector to invest because they wouldn't invest it without that prize. But the prize encourages them to invest. And if you then find a way of using that investment to raise capabilities, you're on the way to success. And if you look at what made the automobile experiment in India work, or actually the garments industry in Bangladesh take off, it was basically ex-post prizes. It was the ex-post prize of the MFA, which was passed back to the Koreans, who, who then invested it in transferring capabilities to Bangladesh. That's the secret of the garments industry success. And the same thing happened with the Indian auto industry, right? So I think we need to find out new, creative, and very innovative ways of creating incentives for financing that transfer of organizational knowledge, how to run a factory. In and, and make globally competitive components in, in electronics or um, and these no, that knowledge is very specific to sector, right? So someone who runs a very successful garments industry has no clue how to produce a very successful widget for a, for a, for a phone because that has a different supply chain, different quality control issues, different inventory management issues, different um, all kinds of issues which are not things you can learn in a book. It's tacit knowledge. It's also learning by doing. It needs to be financed. You have to build those organizations. That's the challenge of industrial policy. The challenge of industrial policy is identifying the right problem and then finding the right way of financing to solve the problem so that your money doesn't get captured by corrupt and politically connected people, which is the norm in, in a place like Bangladesh. So I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank no, thanks. <laughs> big piece in the, in the, in the puzzle. And if I may just start, I'm, I'm doing some work in uh, Tanzania and other Eastern African communities. And in relation to this aspect, this issue of reaching the standard is a massive problem. And very often, lots of companies who are trying to exactly uh, reach that level of competitiveness that allow them to be in the international market uh, require a number of testing facilities, a number of uh, type of production services that it's very difficult to, to find because for many of them there are important costs associated with that. So the story of countries have been managing to do some of this uh, catching up in terms of technology, quality standards and so on, have also paid it to, through this uh, provision of quasi-public good technology services in, in different sectors. So we learn quite a lot about how complex the, 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 the old situation is, how complex even these industries. I think you also were referring about are difficult is even to understand, you know, textile, garments, you know, that we are operating in a context of uh, value chain with, with very specific uh, conditions. So I would like to, to open the floor because I think we had already a very rich discussion um, and then we will have a round of, of questions and potentially a final uh, wrap up and a final impression from, from our speakers. Uh, may I invite uh, the floor to raise some questions? We have one here, two, two. I would suggest to collect three questions and then, please, and thank if you, you want to introduce yourself, that would be your advice. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chief. Uh, I want to follow up uh, some of uh, Mr. Khan's points, which I mostly agree with, except that I think that it probably isn't true that a clothing producer can't become a producer of something else, because what we have seen in you know, most of the countries which have successfully moved from one industry to another is precisely that those who learn how to market their things, create <coughs> the right value chain, and stay in the same industry in the sense of the same sort of production, the same sort of market, in the sense that um, small manufacturers are the same value chain as clothing, but textiles certainly are not the same industry as clothing. 
at least people can move from one. I mean, the original uh, producers in the garbage industry in Bangladesh were people who were producing garbage all their lives. They moved into it with some foreign investment. There were um, even people who never produced anything in the world. Yeah, they, exactly. <laughs> they were not even in business. Which is fine. They were like we're equally moving to something else. So I, I, I think we need to ask exactly what it is that will make them move into it. Uh, which brings me back to the point that governments were the diversification strategy for Bangladesh. And we must remember that. They were an excessively successful one, but they were. We must be careful not to have 84% being in something else when we meet in 20 years' time. But I, I think perhaps that's why it is that they were able to do it, and it's partly the MFA, of course, and the mm -hmm. MFA went. But we can't recreate the MFA for and other industries. So what do you think could be done? And I, I don't tell me government assistance. That isn't what's created uh, clothing, and isn't what's going to create anything very much in Bangladesh at the moment. What sorts of things, which markets are similar, use similar enough supply chains to garments that a reasonably enterprising producer of garments who gets bored with garments can move into it? Yeah, I, I think in, in Colombia, where garment producers move into paper and into flowers, and these are all, in a sense, going to the same markets. So it needs some imagination. Um. Let's do one last one. If the question is raised again before, then you. Please. Uh, my name is Mosheran Mosheran. I'm a Bangladeshi citizen. I'm just now working in London. Uh, so it's a very good presentation, having uh, very good ideas and facts uh, there. So I think, yes, Bangladesh is uh, now uh, 60, 84% uh, of the export zone, which is very good. And we are ranking a lot of them. But where is the second car? Because there is a limitation on the peak. Somewhere it will go down. So I think Bangladesh policymakers should think just now so that where we can start another car that can kind of take this journey forward. And I don't think that, that very much thinking is going on. According to the policy statement, as uh, it mentioned, that is, uh, even uh, uh, yeah, in, in the Bangladesh of context, I think export led initiative is more feasible than import subsidy. For example, two things is very different is contributing the economy on its garments and on its labor. Both are happening in the foreign country. So I think uh, 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 in, in like no like her, I think entrepreneurship is there. But I very much agree with uh, Mr. Mustafa that there is no organization. So I don't think that is that is much good feasible. And uh, 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 for uh, electronics and light engineering. We can produce locally, but can we comp uh, compete with China in this production? It's not possible. And unless we, as my, my, uh, if, if we can that, as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, told, that is join the multinational firm and create market there, so an organization that can be a um, uh, good solution. And but I have two questions. That is, yes, we are optimizing the workforce, but is it in inclusive? But now sustainable development goal, like goal eight, goal about implement the employment, we said go out as well as inclusion part four. So disabled people are fifteen percent of any population. In Bangladesh even it will be higher than that. So is that uh, disabled people have uh, 
uh, access in the Arctic uh, without uh, policies is creating employment problems. Unless uh, those people are included in, in our economy, our industry, then we will just leave them there behind. So that is the big question, how we can bring those people. And then my last question is, like now people are talking about technology. How Bangladesh can ad take advantage of technology for the information, uh, internet of things is big issue now going to happen in the, in the next few years. And UK is investing a lot to take the advantage and being the leader of that. How Bangladesh can take the minimum uh, portion of the whole canvas and can practice that in Bangladesh and bring those things in globally. So that way I think Bangladesh can uh, are more to export led uh, intervention than uh, in the Okay. Uh, shall we have the first round of, is it a brief question because or is it a comment? Is it? Uh, uh, it's, it's a brief question. Please then raise that one in the first round. Um, okay. Well, we heard kind of a call for cultural change, a call for economic development. We've also heard that there's kind of a dearth of law. And my question is to what extent can the cultural and economic development arguments? Uh, actually come to fruition without an enabling legal legal framework. Okay, I guess this is for, more for Jack. Um, should we start from Tara, and then we, we keep, if there are issues that you want to, to address that are raised, there is one specific question for Mushtaq, and I think some of the others are pretty general, so, you know, so if you want to address some of them, uh, start. Well, I'd just like to kind of um, echo your point about, about inclusive inclusive employment and I think that uh, you know uh, it, it, it really is it really is important to understand that uh, you know when we talk about um, inclusive growth or inclusive development or inclusive employment you know we're talking about a large um, kind of um, straight strata of the population which is it's n and it's not just the it's not just disabled I mean you know like the the idea that uh, you know um, Again, you know, go, going back to my, um, you know, the, peop the people, or the, 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 the sector that I work on, you know, like uh, the idea that um, you kind of put one woman into employment, but then you actually disadvantage or exclude the other women in the household is really important because, you know, you, one woman goes out to work and who does the care work is the younger daughter or the, or the elder woman in the household or, or the sister or somebody. You know, and I think I think it's it's really important to understand that these dynamics are important to, to take into account that you can't just optimize, as I said, you know, like optimization is not about just labor force participation. It has to be about other things which includes inclusive development. Would you like to Okay, I think there are a couple of very interesting questions. Um, moving between sectors is happening all the time. Mm. It's happening in Bangladesh. So for example, the garments industry is backward linking into fabrics, dyeing, all kinds of things. In fact, it's, I, I, I was looking for the latest figures, but I couldn't find it, but more than 60% of um, the fabrics and so on are now domestically produced. In fact, Bangladesh is, is the top three, sometimes the number one, raw cotton importer in the world. So it's, hu it's a huge importer of raw cotton. Where is this raw cotton going? It's going into spinning and, we and, and weaving and also into um, knitwear, right? So it's happening. It's not just garments. It, there's a huge backward linkage going on into, um, particularly into textiles, but also into accessories of different sorts and so on. The question is the pace at which it is happening, right? So can, can anyone accelerate this? As we saw, there are, you know, incipient, you know, fridge makers and air conditioning and so on. It's, it's very, it's not, not happening. What's the real constraint? The real constraint is that you need a, a working model which is, which has certain characteristics, right? And that and it should be easy to emulate for people with certain organizational skills already. But it should also be a complete model that you can copy. The, the reason why there was this explosive growth is that Desh garments produced a model which was completely linked to the global chain, right? It was, and so people could just copy it and they encouraged the copying 
because they didn't stop any of their managers going and setting up their own companies. The, the uh, hundred managers left within a couple of years, set up a hundred new companies, and then there was this. So replication can be extremely rapid once the model exists. Now, in none of these, so, so the textile sector in Bangladesh, for example, can't even meet the local domestic demand. It's not that competitive, so there's a lot of imported fabric. So it's not yet a sector in which there will be massive replication at a global scale. It has to go several steps beyond its current level of competitiveness to achieve that. Can this be done? It can be done. But that's where it, you need that investment. And so, so your question is, um, the state won't do it, but what's the alternative? I think that the problem is that the, when you say the corporate sector will do it, the corporate sector in itself won't do it because the corporate sector is there to make money, right? So there are enough markets out there for the corporate sector to go into, and MNCs go and look to set up their OEMs in places where the components producers are already close to global competitiveness. They are not going to invest hugely in that. It might be a little bit short, and if you give them some incentives, they will then build up the component suppliers. So you have this example of the Viet Honda in, in Vietnam. But look at the history of the Vietnamese motorcycle <coughs> sector before Honda comes in. Yeah. So I had a PhD student who did a whole PhD on, 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 on motorcycles and other sectors in, in Vietnam. It's a fascinating story. The reason why Honda, went, so initially Honda was just doing assembly. Honda then became committed to the um, local comp um, component suppliers because in between, Vietnam basically broke out, opened the border to China, and there was a China shock, and a huge number of relatively low quality Chinese motorcycles came in, and that, those Chinese motorcycles were easy to copy, right? So the problem is that you need to have reached a certain stage before you can reach the next stage. The Chinese motorcycles were easy to copy, and so Vietnamese components producers did backward engineering and copied it, and the Chinese weren't copyrighted and patented and so on and so on. So they built up a lot of cap capacities during that China shock period, and then there was a huge anti-Chinese kind of movement within Vietnam because of all kinds of tensions with China, and they started blocking the border. Then Honda came in and said, actually, we can save costs. The MNC's interest is to save costs, right? So they shifted their supply chain or bits of it to Vietnam because it actually was cheaper suddenly to do that, right? Whereas if the gap is too big and if the wastage is too high and the productivity is too low, they won't do that. They will bring in their supplies from their, their home countries. So the trick is, so, so there are various strategies. One is you have some intermediate strategy bringing up your component suppliers to a high enough plateau the gap with international competitiveness is not very big, then MNCs will do the trick, and for simply economic calculations, right? But if the gap is too big, which is the case in the Bangladeshi electronics, then it, no one is going to come and invest in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So at that intermediate level, you have to have this messy kind of um, strategy where you're going to do something with the state, but keeping in mind that the state has flaws. So you shouldn't expect the state to do something which will definitely fail because it will definitely be captured. But if you can design some strategies of support which are less likely to be captured, it's worth trying it, because actually we have no other way of doing it. Otherwise, you just wait for the multinationals to come. They won't come. They have better places to go to. Right? There are many other competing countries which have niches here and niches there, and that's where they're going. Multinationals go where the supply chain is already good. Multi or, or they go as pure assemblers and bring in all their components from their you know, other multinationals. So even the component supply chain is now controlled by multinationals. And this is the real problem. Even when you go to the components of this phone, the components are made by other multinationals, right? So you have to then insert yourself into that increasing, very dense space and find niches where you can bring up your capability sufficiently that you, your little niche becomes globally competitive. That's not easy. It needs... You know, the kind of stuff that Antonio is talking about needs an analysis of supply chains and your existing levels of competitiveness and where you are and how you get up even close to being competitive. Yeah, uh, if I could try and address your point about the enabling legal framework. As I say, I'm coming from it as a standpoint primarily of being a European Union lawyer. Um, but so a part, the way I respond to that is partly what should the European Union do, because it is, after all, an external actor, 
but also what can it do? And the answer is what, in terms of what can it do, is constrained very much by the nature of global trade law. Because, um, you know, if we, we have to actually, one of the main problems, uh, you could argue, is that some 20 years ago at Seattle, uh, an attempt to kind of ensure that there was a balance between uh, global economic governance through trade and global social governance, or labour governance, if you like, um, was unsuccessful. And so you then had two different routes. You had you could be global trade law moving in a particular direction, and then alongside that, partly to try and achieve some balance, some kind of calibration of labour rights and social rights, was to have the ILO core labour standards. The point about the ILO core labour standards is that they just are a kind of checklist of five, of five very specific standards, particularly you know, ending child labour, having freedom of association, um, the, the, the right then to the right to strike, uh, 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 very specific rights. Um, the, the, one of the reason, one of the main, some of the main objectors to this uh, kind of fusion of trade and, and, and social laws at a global level were governments like Bangladesh arguing that this was actually really about protectionism, and there, was some, there is some merit to this argument, it's actually about keeping jobs in places like the United States and Europe rather than having jobs in, in Bangladesh and elsewhere. Now, um, the EU then tried to, to some extent, circumvent this. You could argue to export this sort of EU social model through trade policy by saying that the general system of preferences that I've been talking about should have uh, additional obligations, labour conditionality, um, and it, 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 it granted a particular preference to Pakistan. Not surprisingly, that was then challenged by India, because India didn't get the same preference as Pakistan before the WTO, and one consequence of that was that the EU was warned by the WTO bodies that it had to be very careful about this labour conditionality. And this then limits it. The EU's approach has then been to say, well, we won't try and broaden labour standards to have a floor of rights go beyond these core labour standards into issues like, for example, a living wage, which isn't one of the, the core labour standards. Um, we'll limit it to these ILO core, and then no one can accuse us of trying to export European social rights. And, and I said that there is a, this particular constraint. And so whilst it is helpful for the EU through the Sustainability Compact to focus on the implementation of the labour laws, things like collective bargaining and all these, all these issues that I've mentioned, um, it doesn't address much of the enabling issues like access to justice, uh, like places to get free rights. And I think it's very interesting you have your rights cafes because you're actually filling a need that isn't otherwise being filled. And, and organisations like the EU and others are not necessarily pushing for it because of the particular tie-in with trade. Um, reporting, um, having a floor of rights that is broad. Now, a floor of rights can mean that you know, you have very basic levels of protection initially. So, you know, period, that, that if there is, to the extent there is, for example, maternity leave, that it, 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 it may be only a relatively short period, but there is at least a guarantee of a return to work. And, and one, from that, you can build upwards. But, you know, there has to be, I think, a, a new, new thinking to trade and labour rights globally to really break this on pass. Otherwise... Trade policy is just perpetuating many of the problems that are already there, as highlighted in your report. Is there anything you uh, well, I mean, so many questions. I kind of <laughs> lost yeah, track. Well, of. Left with more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I think I mean uh, 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 the lady left, but I think uh, we can't actually. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, state may not work. State may not function in uh, in Bangladesh as or like as far as uh, the sort of uh, economic policies we want. But I think we then, as part of, let's say, for example, this work about development strategy and national uh, economic strategy, we also have to work on uh, like coming up with a functional state because there are some functions that actually still no one can do other than the state. For example, this, uh, this huge public investment that is required for these different services 
that actually not even big businesses can or will do. I mean, not only the SMEs, but even the big businesses can do well. I mean, even there, I mean, even the big businesses, I mean, big businesses in Bangladesh are maybe far from even the smallest multinationals. But even for them, I think it's, it, it'll be quite expensive. So definitely, I mean, uh, uh, there is a huge scope uh, for the role of the state, uh, and then we actually have to, as part of, uh, and I think, I think at, at least uh, as part of India's work, actually that is a big area we are focusing, continuously focusing, that we have to come up with an innovative role of the state, if not the traditional uh, role of the state. And it, it goes hand in hand. I mean, you can't actually afford without that sort of a state uh, in Bangladesh and in countries like us. Uh, yeah, so. I would just add a couple of things. I'm going to stand up again because I, I can just see the screen and I can't actually see you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, completely point taken, right? As Kazi was saying, for us, the role of the state is, is crucial because public services in the end need to be pr provided by the state. It, it's an obligation. That, that's the way we see it. And it's, it's I mean, in kind of the, what I should have said at the beginning is that this is just the start of a conversation, right? So we know perfectly well that the conditions under which both Taiwan and South Korea were able to industrialize and Japan were completely different. Many of the, of the global rules, the WTO rules and bilateral and multilateral agreements were not there. So mm. this is an extra um, layer of, of complexity. And I would just kind of draw a bit of caution in terms of so the two, two words of caution here. So I think as, as Ruth was, was starting to raise, I mean, this over-reliance on multinationals and, and just expecting them to, to come in and do knowledge transfer and invest and, and increase the skills. I come from Mexico. That never happened, right? We're still <laughs> in the same pothole that we've been for decades. So, I mean, a word of caution there as a Mexican, but also as, as a researcher. And then something that, that we've been quite keen on, on discussing and kind of the reason why we're approaching this from the point of view of smaller and medium, but particularly medium and growing businesses, yeah. is precisely because we wanna, we wanna find this to, to grow within the country so that it is more rooted, it's less footloose, so that it can actually have a longer term, um, a longer term solution, but also because we're hoping that this isn't just linked to global value chains like garments has been, but we're thinking that maybe there is some kind of regional uh, trade um, opportunities. Some of the, of the business people we spoke to were already looking towards India, right? And they were saying, well, we already have some kind of trade relationship with it, it's <coughs> helped us. It's helped us increase our standards, not just in terms of reverse engineering, but, but there is something there. So these are some of the issues that we are we are exploring, and this is very much a conversation that I think we will need to have for decades, because an industrial policy is not just for two, five years, it's for 20, 30, 50, 100 years, and that's hopefully a point that we will get to. Uh, I think uh, just uh, one thing, I mean, uh, uh, that gentleman uh, he was uh, referring to, I mean, that we have to have this export-oriented strategy, and that we have. Problem with it, with it is, and, and uh, especially, I mean, when I was uh, looking at the current seven five year plan that we have, I mean, there's uh, there was a background paper on export diversification in the current five year plan, and uh, we were discussing, I mean, how can you have export diversification without economic diversification? I mean, that perspective in this five year plan, as far we can see it, uh, is that. Uh, that export diversification without economic diversification. I mean, you don't have a pro product basket outside garments and few other low-end products. Then how come you, you know, what you get out of export diversi diversification? I mean, what you diversify your export with? You have a very, very limited export basket. So what, I mean, it's kind of like, uh, I mean, you know, we have this saying in Bangla, and I think that's also in English, that putting the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's... Uh, so we just confident that actually sometimes there are lots of opportunities in the internal market that are missed exactly yeah. because yeah. your products are a, at a quality which is yeah. significantly lower than the one that comes from China, Vietnam and other countries. Mm -hmm. And people, even within the internal market, prefer demand to go to get these products, right? Yeah. So if you yeah. don't reach that level, even your internal market could, could be massive, right? It could give lots of learning opportunities, yeah. could grow. And of course there are issues that if all countries think about adopting export strategies, you have to understand who's going to buy all these <laughs> things. You. And if I can add just one last thing, you know, we've mentioned these internet of things and so on. I think we have to be very careful in these issues because 
there, are, there is lots of uh, discussion around technologies without knowing what the technologies are about, right? So the specific context, I think, would be much more interesting to try to talk about robotics. For example, China at the moment today is the first importer of robotics in the world. So, you know, Internet of Things or this type of issues that have been capturing European discussion are really inappropriate for this country because this country has no manufacturing base, right? So the Internet of Things cannot work in a country without really, apart from Germany, if you other Japan, if you other strong manufacturing system, make no sense. And unfortunately, the way in which it is presented in the European discussion is again the result of a certain type of political economic context where the industrial policies are designed this way because certain countries push for certain type of ideas. Sorry, I got passionate into it. <laughs> um, uh, please, we have some, some, some other 10, 15 minutes, I would say. 10, 15 minutes, yeah. Um, other questions? Please. Okay. I wonder to what extent your, um, recommend your work into the recommendations for industrial policy were also feed into your work for other the wider enabling environment, especially maybe with regards to expanding housing policy and, if, and decentralizing infrastructure. Because for Bangladesh, I think a different problem is centralization into Dhaka and rather than focus into the other industrial cities and also you know, like informal settlements and then the government's equal like contradictory policies into destroying the settlements where these people will live to even provide the care in the first place when they need a place to live, to work in that. So just your work around that. Any other question? Please. First, ask about other sort of sectors that won't be just talked about sort of government sector, but what about sort of um, other exporting goods like tea, um, food, like broken food for seafood mm -hmm. as well? Um, Would you see that as a sort of um, a sector that maybe Bangladesh could enter into for both imports and exports? Please, I'll ask you. <laughs> um, we, we've sort of touched on the, the role of the state, especially in relation to um, women's unpaid care work, but I'm just interested to hear what people do think from your different perspectives the role of the state might be actually in industrial policy. Okay. We're going to have another conference, <laughs> today's <laughs> conference on the next, but we will try. In line with also the role of the state, um, it, it almost feels like before you can get to any of this stuff, particularly the picture you paint of the Bangladeshi state, that there's an awful lot of work to be done with the Bangladeshi state in terms of how it's investing its money. I'm just interested in terms of, particularly given that sort of engaging with the Ethiopian state, uh, and Ethiopia is essentially a rival that could overtake Bangladesh in many, in many ways at some point. And just sort of what type of messages and how do you? Because I, I work with Christian Aid and we work obviously a lot with the society and the state across the world with the state. And it's definitely one of these things that we're experiencing. How do you get the state to listen, particularly on industrial policy? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let me start this time from uh, here. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll try to answer your question. I mean, that's again opening yet another ca massive can of worms, right? But but in terms of, sorry, I realize. Um, so the. So the answer is, is yes. So what we're saying is yes, an industrial policy, but as, as I was saying at the beginning, it needs to be accompanied by a series of other policies, housing, for example, education, health, etc., that can help. Because what's the purpose of opening up new jobs if you can't have women and men that you know have managed to eat so that they can reach uh, their, their workplace? So it needs to be a comprehensive, and that's what I meant by seeing this as a longer term um, plan, yes. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, to add with Leela, I mean, and, uh, uh, going back to what I was talking about uh, policy integration and coordination. So I think that, was, that is also an aspect that was in our mind because I mean, uh, referring back to the FGD, the garment workers, I mean, this, the, 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 some of these areas are actually a huge concern for them. Education, health, housing, of course, that also I mentioned. Uh, uh, unpaid care work or care, their care responsibilities. I mean, if, uh, uh, referring back to Dipta's uh, uh, movie, I mean, 
if we can actually uh, take care of some of those areas. I mean, I mean, because those are also areas of expenditure for them. So they can sort of save a lot on their very minimum uh, wage that <coughs> they survive on. Uh, about your question of other sectors, like tea and leather, uh, I mean, uh, from us, I mean, as I, uh, I mentioned, that we were actually interested in uh, in sectors that are more value-adding, more technology-intensive, uh, more innovative. Uh, I don't think tea or leather, actually, they're more like primary goods. I think the panel onwards can explain more. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I think uh, was that there was something else on like state's role. I think we talked about them. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> there's there's not a great deal I can say about what more the state can do. Um, uh, just just from the perspective of the research that I've been doing and colleagues within our frame project, um, we are very interested uh, in the way in which there's a, a kind of a new approach through. Um, the EU's human rights policies, and the EU says that you know human rights are a, a silver thread running through all policies, including trade and development. Um, and one of the ideas behind that is that um, this point about decentralisation involving non-state actors. That actually, one of the ways in which to get the state to do more is through empowering others and through pushing decentralisation. For example. Um, human rights country strategies is the approach that is adopted. You look at the whole country approach uh, and, and see ways in which um, uh, you can have diffusions of power and you can provide support. And this can be done. This is primarily a development policy rather than a trade policy, clearly. Um, but uh, it, it seems to me if you can um, address issues like how do you. Um, support human rights defenders uh, and NGOs and indigenous uh, groups, um, you can have uh, more of this diffusion of power. And this often gets states to listen. The old approach was very much always talk to the state, persuade them to invest, uh, persuade them to adopt certain laws, and everything else will follow. And I think it's much more important, in fact, to look at ways in which you can work locally. You can almost bypass the state. Um, and go direct to the people. But this is um, something that requires resources, and I think this is where the EU is weak. Um, I mean, just speaking to people in the um, EU uh, trade and, and development uh, director generals of the Commission, what they say to us is, well, at the moment, you know, because, uh, you know, Rana Plaza was like this big wake-up call, we're putting lots of resources into Bangladesh. But then maybe two or three years' time, something will happen in another country and, and, and there'll be a focus there. And, and you know, the EU is not... The EU uh, actually doesn't have the kind of central staff and resources to actually really follow through on a lot of these policies. But this is really where some of... I think there needs to be a bit of lateral thinking here, not just focusing on what the state should do. Now we moved up, uh, I cannot imagine anyone else talking better about the role of the state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's another the, thing the problem is that that's, a st that's another day. I mean, that's a big <laughs> question. I think there was a question about competitive and, and, and potentially competitive sectors. There are many in Bangladesh which are actually quite promising. So pharmaceuticals, for example, mm -hmm. is a very promising sector. Bangladesh is exporting pharmaceuticals. At the low end, again, it's assembly pharmaceuticals. It's importing the components from uh, more advanced countries, but it's a very successful sector. You'd be surprised to know shipbuilding is a, is a potentially competitive sector in Bangladesh, right? It makes ships. So there are a number of such sectors which can grow if you have a strategy of, of supporting and taking it up to a competitive level. Bangladesh already exports small ships. On the role of the state, um, hmm. <laughs> so the, the, you see, you can have a, a, an idea in your mind of what the state should be doing. And often that's not very useful, right? You have to start with what is your state in your context, and that reality is actually quite depressing often. And then you have to say, well, what is a feasible program of getting this state to do a little bit better? So what could the Bangladeshi state do a little bit better? It could spend a little bit more on infrastructure, education, and health. It spends 
extremely little on health and education. Mm -hmm. And it gets very good results from this because of very successful delivery mechanisms with NGOs and so on. And so it does very well in, in global criteria. Mm -hmm. And it thinks that's the way of actually not spending anything, <laughs> right? So we have to put a lot of pressure on the Bangladeshi state, actually spend more on health and education. And it can do that. This is achievable. What else can it do? It, and then you have, to do, you have to do something in terms of feasible industrial policy, right? Which is not giving large subsidies to big sectors which will just be wasted, but doing these small experiments, and here international partners, donors, um, <coughs> DFID, the World Bank, can partner up with the government in designing programs and saying, this is the way we will fund capacity development, provided the Bangladesh government puts in a little bit here as well, and industry invests a little bit here as well, it's by locking in co-investments that we can get the state to do things, by creating incentives sorry, for sorry. the state to, to do things. Okay. The most important problem for the state in Bangladesh now is a political crisis. That I think that the, the, the crisis is... Shall I stop? No, 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 no seriously, no. I was just explaining the clock was slow, that was all. Right. You keep so, going. So the crisis is that and I think the most important problem that the state has to solve <laughs> is the political crisis between the, the elites, which is possibly taking the country into a very serious conflict and potentially even civil strife in three to four to five years' time if even, we don't do something, <laughs> or even before that, if mm. we don't do something. And it's basically the monopolization of power by one party to the exclusion of all others. And I don't have any answer to that. But donors and, and civil society, people have to start thinking about what to do about this. Finally, I would say that a lot of you know, well-meaning things about labor rights and so on, I completely support. But we have to be very careful about the instruments through which you are thinking that you will achieve this. Okay. People talk about trade unions. And you have to understand that trade unions are located in a political context which sucks. Right? So trade unions are not independent actors mm -hmm. which represent workers, take dues from them, and then represent their rights. Never in the history of Bangladesh has that happened. Trade unions basically are connected to political parties. They spend money. They don't take money from the workers. They spend money on, on the workers, building up coalitions, which can then be taken out on the streets in political conflicts between the parties. That history of trade unionism has been so destructive for Bangladesh in the yeah. past that, and, and simply to say we want trade unions here, there, and everywhere, isn't understanding the political economy of the country and what a trade union means in the context of a country like Bangladesh. So if you want to do something useful about labor rights and so on, think hard about the mechanisms and think how those mechanisms will work in the political economy context of the country that you're talking about. Then we're going to make progress. Ethiopia looks like a very strong state, very industrial policy. The Ethiopian state has many problems. It has huge problems. Um, we work, I mean, I've worked a lot in Ethiopia. A state might look like it's authoritarian and command and in control of industrial policy. It's actually driven with internal conflicts. It has a lot of secret companies no one knows anything about. A lot of the investments are happening with, with companies which are very strongly colluding and, and part of the political deal. It's not yet so sure that Ethiopia will be a big success story. They are investing a lot in manufacturing, but that's a long shot away from that manufacturing becoming globally competitive. The test of Ethiopian success will be, will these uh, garments and textiles and other industries, footwear that they're investing in, do they actually become globally competitive industries which can survive without the subsidies? That has to be proven. So I, I think every state has a problem. The, uh, but all I'm saying is it's not so clear that the Ethiopian state is so much better than the Bangladeshi state. They have different problems, and they're completely differently constituted states which have different types of problems. Ika, you last words. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, um, just, just I would just say that when we're looking at industrial policies and the role of the state, we should we should conceptualize um, women not just as um, as workers, but also as, as as consumers and then as citizens who have an active decision making role to play in this process. Thanks. Great. I think we had the.
very good discussion, uh, and we touched upon many, many of the issues that actually the report uh, points to, and uh, I'm sure that we are going to have other occasions to go deeper into some of this. Thanks to all of you. I would like to give a round of applause to our speakers. And uh, please follow up um, on uh, the next events. We're going to have other uh, events within this series, and hopefully we're going to uh, be again working with Action Aid to uh, discuss this very important issue. Thanks, thanks a lot for the question. Thank you. Sorry, I thought you no, were no. pleased. Um, I do need to leave. Yes. I was just explaining because you looked at the clock. And <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't that. It was because you said you looked at the clock and said we have 10 more minutes, but actually the clock was 10 minutes slow. That was all. <laughs> no, it's fine. There was a I have to get a train. I have to get a train. It's also I have to get a train, and it probably will be quite tight now. But there is another train after it. There is another train. Hi, Antonio. Very nice to meet you. Sorry, I interrupted you at the beginning, but just because I was fine, I wanted to have more rounds of what you were saying. It's very interesting. <laughs> Are you, are you actually uh, just visiting at the moment and going back, or are you in London? Yeah. Yeah. That's really lucky. So How long will you be, will you be around? Actually, I'm, uh, I'm staying at Brighton. I'm going there, back there, and the other time flying out to Norway, and then all the time back. So we can be in touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Please give me your card. Yeah. Uh, I think I also yeah. have yeah, 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 yeah. inputs I can give you. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of information. Yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of information. Yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of information. Yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of information. Yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of